Luke chapter 23 starting in verse 1. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him, that's Christ, to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. We're going to stop right there, because there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Luke's account of this first, of Jesus' first appearance before Pilate, is very short. I mean, that was only five verses. Um, Mark and Matthew also have short versions of it. John gives us a lot more information and the whole conversation that goes on between Jesus and Pilate. So, what we're gonna, it would be good if we could have like two columns of Luke and John and look at both. Because we're going to be looking at a lot of stuff from John. I wouldn't have you going back and forth, but uh, it'll be, it's important to, to get a fuller understanding. So, What's the context? Where were we? Uh, in the last few weeks, we saw Jesus was arrested in the middle of the night, taken to Annas, then taken to Caiaphas. Those were in the night hours. Early morning, as soon as the sun comes up, they, the Sanhedrin gets together, condemns him to death for blasphemy. And so they quickly rush him to Pilate. Verse 1 says, then the whole multitude of them, so we're talking about the entire Sanhedrin, arose and led him to Pilate. Now, who's Pilate? We haven't talked much about him. You know, he is the Roman governor of Judea. Uh, I haven't done a map in a while. Let's do this really quick. A quick history. You got here... Uh, let's say this here is the Sea of Galilee. That's the Jordan right there. That's the Dead Sea down there. Up here is Galilee. Did I say that Pilate was the governor of Galilee? Judea. Of Judea, correct. Judea. Okay. Judea. Judea is down here. Alright. Jerusalem, somewhere here. Okay, in Judea. So, what happens is, really quick history... 30 years earlier, of course this entire land is ruled by the Romans. But what happens is, 30 years earlier, uh, the Romans had allowed King Herod, Herod the Great, remember King Herod the Great, he was a guy who was king at the time when Jesus was born, the same guy who killed the babies. He ruled this entire, all of Palestine. As soon as he died... It was split up into sections and his sons became governors of the smaller sections. His son Herod Adipas became the, uh, the governor up in Galilee and his other son Archelaos that was ruling <laughs> that guy who was ruling Judea was a horrible guy and Rome removed him pretty quick. And after they removed him, they put in a Roman governor. Alright? So, since like 6 AD, Judea has had Roman governors. And the Roman governor at this time is Pontius Pilate. So, keep in mind, if you're going to be the governor of Judea, it's not going to be an easy job. Uh, the Jews don't take very well the fact that they have a pagan <coughs> Gentile ruling over them. All right? The Jews have spent the last couple of centuries turning their land into a bloodbath against all the foreign oppressors. So they're not happy having a Gentile governor. So they don't like Pilate. Pilate doesn't like them. 
another thing about Pilate uh, I need to point out. Pilate was not a nice guy. And the reason I point this out is that if all you do is read the trials of Jesus, some people tend to think that he was a nice person because he really does try to get Jesus freed. He really does put a lot of effort in trying to get Jesus to go free. And the Jews are just not letting him go. And so people say, oh, he, he, he's a good guy, he had a sense of justice. Yeah, maybe more than the Jews who, who arrested him were a bunch of crooks, but he still wasn't the best guy in the world. You can just see that by the fact that a number of times he says, Jesus is innocent, Jesus is innocent, Jesus is innocent. And then at the end he says, well, never mind, just take him off to crucify him. So you see that there's a problem here with justice. Um, okay, so that's who Pilate is. The Jews have arrested Jesus. They take him to Pilate. In John 18, you don't have to go there, but I will read it to you. In John 18, it says, They led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. That's the governor's residence. And it was early morning. So it's really early in the morning, probably 6 or 7 o'clock. Uh, it says, but they themselves, get this, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Let me say that again, because it's amazing. They get to the Pilate's house, and they want to take Jesus in for him to be condemned. But they won't go into the house, because they want to be able to celebrate the Passover, and they think that if they go into a Gentile's house, they're going to be defiled. And they want to be able to keep their religious laws. So think about this. You have a group of people who are in the middle of performing the most wicked act in the history of the world, murdering the Son of God, but they're still keeping their religious laws. The Passover, which was a picture of Christ, they, they, they are like, we need to be able to celebrate the Passover, so we don't want to get defiled, but we'll kill Jesus, who is the actual fulfillment of the Passover. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? But that's how it is with a lot of religious people. And, and here's the thing, that, here's the lesson there that we've we got to keep in mind all the time. God hates, that's a strong statement that I'm using, God hates religion that is without faith. When it comes to a religion, people being religious, but without faith, read, read, read uh, Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 is all about condemning Israel not because they're not keeping the feasts, not because they're not keeping the Sabbaths, not because they're not doing the sacrifices. They're doing it. But there is no faith. There is no love. There is no trust. There is no obedience. And they're saying, and, and God is saying to them, I'm sick and tired of your religion. I'm sick and tired. I, I, my soul hates it. Can't stand it anymore because it's not from the heart. If true religion is from the heart, that is acceptable. Let me tell you a quick story. This was oh, 15, 20 years ago. I don't remember when this was. A long time ago. My sister had a friend. and It was Sarakosti. It was Lent. You know, a few days before Easter. And my sister had a friend who was fasting. And they'd gone out for for whatever, I don't know. And this friend of hers started talking about someone with the most foul, disgusting language. And my sister said to her, hmm, I, I thought you were fasting. And this girl says, well, God doesn't care about what I say. He cares about what I eat. Now, I wasn't a Christian at that time, but I was still shocked. <laughs> I, did, I, I, did, I, wa I, didn't, I wasn't a Christian, but I was like, this is just nuts. Now that I actually know the Bible, <laughs> I mean, where th this is the exact... Jesus, when, when they had addressed Jesus about food, he had said, nothing that goes in through the mouth defiles a man. 
Because it doesn't go to your heart, it goes to the stomach and then ends up in the toilet. Those are Jesus' words. What comes out of the mouth is what defiles a man. But we have just taken light and call it darkness and call it darkness light. That's how it was in Isaiah's day. This is how it was in Jesus' day. This is how it still is today. Here you have a bunch of people who want to keep all the religious rules and they're killing Jesus in the process. So, they've gone to the praetorium. They're sitting outside. They don't want to go in because they're going to get defiled. Which, by the way, let me just say this really quick. There were a number of things in the Old Testament that did defile you. Touching a dead body, um, having, you know, touching unclean animals, all kinds of stuff that did indeed defile you according to the ceremonial law. Coming into contact with Gentiles was not one of them. This was a Jewish thing. So, they don't want to go in. So Pilate comes out. It's not strange that there's someone there uh, bringing, uh, so bringing someone to court early in the morning. What's strange is the fact that he comes out the entire Sanhedrin is there. So, verse, well, it's, this is in John still. It says, uh, Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? This is in John 18, it's not in Luke. What accusation do you bring against this man? What are the charges? You can't just bring someone and say, kill him. What are the charges? What was the charge? Originally. What, 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 why did they, what, when they said, oh, we need to condemn him to death. What was it? Blasphemy. Blasphemy, because he said he was the son of God. Here's the problem though. You can't go to a Roman official and say he blasphemed our religion. What does the Roman care? The Roman is there to keep the peace. He hasn't broken any Roman laws. Pilate could care less. So they can't go to him and say blasphemy. They tried that in car. If you look in Acts, I think it's Acts 18. Some Jews had caught Paul when, they, when he was in Corinth. And they took him to the Roman governor. And they said, this guy is teaching things against our law. And the Roman governor was like, why do I care? And he, he, he kicked them out. So, they, this is not going to stick. They can't go and say blasphemy. So, <laughs> this is an unbelievable statement. They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. Of course he's a criminal. Do you not have to ask why we bring him? Don't ask what the problem is. We've already tried him. We've already decided that he's a criminal. You take him and kill him. This is, this, is, this is not going to fly. Okay? <laughs> They're not going to get by with this. So Pilate, knowing that this is, something's not right here, then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Right? I, 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 if this is something that, if this is your problem, you deal with it. I'm not touching it. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Ah, there's the problem. You see, we want to kill him, but the problem is we don't have the legal right to do it. That's why we want you to do it. Because you have the right to do it. Rome has that right. We don't have that. We're, subje we're sub subjected people to Rome. Quick side note. In case you're thinking, but I remember in the book of Acts, <clears throat> Stephen, who was grabbed by the Jews and stoned, how does that work? I'll tell you how that works. It was illegal. They weren't allowed to do it. That was, like, that was mob rule there. That wasn't here. They want to try and make it look official. So they take him to, to the Roman. Back to Luke. Because this is where the parallel account comes in. Luke, back to Luke chapter 23. In verse 2, after they, they, they have, he said, okay, you need to give me something. In verse 2 of Luke 23, they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Notice how they've switched. The original accusation was religious. Now they've switched to political because the religious is not going to stick. So, they say he's perverting the nation. How is he doing this? By telling us not to pay taxes and saying that he's the Messiah, which is a king. 
Now, what's, his, what's their point? Their point is, he's a troublemaker. He's an insurrectionist. He's a revolutionary. He's, he's a threat to Rome. He's saying that we shouldn't pay taxes. He's saying he's a king. And the only Caesar is the king. So he's, you need to do something about this guy. They give him the exact accusation that is most serious to Rome. Because if, if Jesus really was a threat to Rome and was a revolutionary, it would be Pilate's job to have him killed. He would have to. That's his job, to keep the peace. So, but let's think about this. First they say, he's told us not to pay taxes, which is utter lie. Complete and utter lie. Just a few days earlier, they had said, should we pay taxes? And he said, Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. In other words, yes, pay your taxes. He had, Jesus was a model citizen. He had told them to pay their taxes. So this is completely false. Utter lie. Then they say, and, and this is, it's not an utter lie, but it's a, it's a perversion. They say, he's the Messiah. He says that he was the Messiah, the king. He is the Messiah, and he is a king, but they're presenting him as a threat to Caesar, as someone who's going to fight against Rome, which is not true. So think about this for a moment. You're Pilate. You know that all the Jews hate Rome. You know that none of the Jews want to pay taxes to Rome. The Jews would love to have someone powerful to overthrow Rome. So what's wrong with this picture? If this person that they're bringing really is a threat to Rome, why are they giving him to me? If this guy is saying all these things, what? if he really could overthrow Rome, if he really is a threat to Rome, he'd be their hero. You're in it. Why are they bringing him to me? So he's like, this is... He's not an idiot. He knows that this is... Uh, he knows that they're a bunch of crooks. He knows that something weird is going on. Now, in verse 3, Luke 23, verse 3, it says, Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. Now, Luke is seriously abbreviating here. <laughs> um, th that's just the gist of everything that was said. Are you a king? It is as you say. Um, John gives us a more full conversation of what was said between Pilate and Jesus. So if you would like to turn there, you could go to John 18, because this is, this is important. If you want to go there, John 18, uh, verse 33, it says, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Alright, so he's not sitting outside in front of everyone. He's gone back in to his house. The Jews are sitting outside. They don't want to get defiled. He comes in with Jesus and says to him, are you the king of the Jews? Really? I don't see any palace. I don't see any crown. I don't see any followers. You? You're, you're the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? <laughs> I don't know why, but I really like that. Je Jesus really doesn't, he's not afraid of Pilate. <laughs> and uh, he basically says, where did you get this question from? Have you heard something about me? Is this, a, you know, am I on a Roman list or something that I'm a, a threat to, to Caesar? Or is this just something that the Jews told you? What's, what's going on? Where, where did this question come from? Verse 35, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Am I a Jew? His point is, of course this is not my question. I have no idea what's going on here. Who are you? What have you done? The Jews brought you here. I don't know what's going on. Verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. Very important. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus' kingdom is not like the kingdoms of the world. It's a different 
kind of kingdom. When he started preaching, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why repent? Because that's how you enter the kingdom. He said to Nicodemus, um, Unless you are born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's how you become a part of it. That's how you see it, through the new birth, through faith. Through repentance. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a kingdom like the rest of the world kingdoms. If, he says, if it were like the other kingdoms, my servants would fight. If my kingdom was like the rest of the kingdoms, I wouldn't be here being delivered to you by the Jews to be killed. If, it, if, if my kingdom was like the world's kingdoms, Pilate and the Jews would be hanging on crosses right now. Not me. So, verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Oh, he's quick. Yes, I just said that I have a kingdom, which means that I'm a king. Okay, are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus is saying, yes, I'm a king, but his kingdom is not the kind of king that is, the king, kingdom that is based upon politics and wars and uh, violence and however it is other kingdoms come into existence. His kingdom is based upon truth, the gospel. This point, verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And walks off. That's it. He's not trying to have a philosophical discussion here. You know, I've wondered what, what truth is. And I, no, he's just... What is truth? It's, it's, he's quite 21st century of him, actually. Quite, uh, I got my truth, you got your truth. What is truth? Who knows? Truth. Never mind. So Pilate has had enough, just walks away. And he goes out and says, And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find... No fault in him at all. Which is the parallel in Luke 23. You can go back to Luke 23 because we're not going to be in John anymore. In Luke 23 and verse 4. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. Of course he finds no fault. There is no fault to, to find. And this is very important here. Here you have Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. There is no one higher than him in the land. He has heard the accusations. He has examined the one who is accused. And he reaches his verdict. And his official verdict is not guilty. Not guilty. At this point, it should have all ended. He's the governor. At this point, it should have all ended... And if anyone had a problem with it, and complained, and wanted to cause trouble, he can get Roman soldiers to put people in order. Jesus, you're free to go. But this is where he makes his first mistake. Up until this point, he's doing things correctly. This is where he makes his first mistake, and everything goes downhill from here. Instead of letting Jesus go as he should have, everyone starts complaining, and he says, well, let's think about this. That's not how it's supposed to be. If you're the governor, make a decision and do it. But in verse 5, it says, But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. It's at that point, because Pilate doesn't want to have much more to do with this, he hears the word Galilee, light bulb comes on. There's a Roman law that says that if you have a criminal who has committed a crime, he can either be tried where he has committed the crime, or he can also be tried in the place of his residence. And he says, oh, Galilee? Is Jesus from Galilee? Yeah. I'm not, I, I'm not in charge of Galilee. Someone else is in charge of Galilee. Herod Antipas is in charge of Galilee. And guess what? He's in town for the Passover. So, send Jesus away. I don't want anything more to do with this. It's Herod's problem now. 
And that's what he does. If you read the next few verses, this is not part of our text for today, but verse 6 says, When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean, and as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. I'm assuming he's there for the Passover. Um, now, we're not going to get into that today. We're going to look at that next week, where he sends him to Herod, and Herod examines him. Of course, Jesus doesn't answer Herod and he has to go back to Pilate and Pilate has to deal with it. But we'll look at that in the next few weeks. So, to close, a couple of small lessons and we'll close. Number one lesson, Jesus is a king. He's not a king like the rest of the world thinks of kings, but he is a king, and this is very important. That means that he is Lord, he does rule, he does reign. He does have subjects. And here's the thing. A lot of people love the idea of having a Jesus who is a savior. But they're not that much happy about an idea of Jesus who is a king. Because, look, if Jesus is going to save me, take me to heaven, great. If Jesus is going to forgive my sins, great. But I don't want Jesus to be telling me how to live my life. Because if he's a king, that means that he can command me what he wants me to do. And I don't want that. But here's the thing. You cannot separate Jesus from being your savior and your king. He is both. If he is not the one, he's not the other. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating salvation by works here. But what I am saying that if God saves you, if Jesus saves you, when he does that, he gives you his spirit. He changes your heart so that you want to obey him. You want to bow to him as your king. You can't separate the two. Jesus is a king. And second lesson that I want you to remember. All these weeks as we're going through the trials of Jesus... There's a reason that Jesus doesn't send fire down from heaven to destroy them all. He could. There's a reason that he doesn't defend himself. Because he doesn't. There's a reason he puts up with all this injustice that's going on. There's a reason why he is willing to be condemned to death. And that is so that you don't have to. So that you won't be condemned to death. That's why he's doing it. He is an innocent man who is willing to die for the crimes of us who are guilty. I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. I'm saying that so that you can glorify him for what he has done. And praise him for his love for you and for his great sacrifice that he has given for all of us. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.